the bridge, how about we all stand and sing this song is called From the Dead. so blind My sin was before me I was swallowed by pride But out of the darkness you brought me to your light You showed me the mercy and opened up my eyes Shake my soul till the very moment when I come home. I say, I'm dead, my heart will overflow. I'm the day you saved my soul. The brilliant light is all This joy is the only sound. Oh, rest my heart forever now. Oh, in your arms I'll always be found. From the day you saved my soul. Every moment when I come home I say, I'll dance with the heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul
tomorrow brings With each morning I rise and sleep My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, oh, oh. My light I I'm just kidding around, sit. <laughs> um, so welcome to the bridge, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just feeling like a little relaxed this morning, and, and I just want to extend that invitation for you guys to just feel re relaxed. Uh, you might not be relaxed after these announcements, but... Um, we'll see how they go. Okay, good. So we'll, we'll see. I'll ask you after the announcements, but uh, yeah, we're in a series called The Story, and we're... Uh, in chapter 11, talking about David becoming a king. He used to be a shepherd, but God brought him through a lot to bring him to the place of being a king. So I'm excited to share that message with you today. And let me welcome you guys to the bridge. Um, thank you guys for coming this morning. My name is Jared Furs. I don't know if Billy said his name, but this is Billy Andre. He's a senior pastor. <laughs> Just means he's old. I'm Jared, the, the young pastor, which is lead, the youth pastor. Lead pastor, not senior. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so I'm just kind of, I watched Nacho Libre last night, so it's senior, senior pastor. Senior, okay. Uh, so child dedications are coming up May 2nd and 3rd. Um, I will be there. Uh, we have a little daughter that we will be dedicating, Kinley Dana Joy first, so you can come support us, take pictures. It'll be great. She's super cute, and she'll smile at you, I promise. She'll smile at you. She smiles at everyone. She actually is really cute. It's ridiculous. It I actually, thought, when I feel kind of bad about my life and like no one likes me, I just look at your daughter and she yeah. smiles like, there's somebody that likes me. Yeah. <laughs> so just, if you pick her up, you're like her new best friend. It's like, <gasps> yeah. so she does all the time. I That's never pick cute. her up, so she hates me. All right. So uh, if you just go to thebridgeconnects.org backslash or ninja chop, whatever helps. That's what I tell my mom. It's called ninja chop. Uh, child dedications. Uh, you can sign your kid up there. Is it, that's called backslash. Is there something called a front slash? There is. I don't know. Forward you, slash? Forward slash. Okay, anyways. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Uh, next slide, please. That's um, what Glenn's for. <laughs> so softball, Monday night co-ed, Thursday night rec league. I signed up for softball this year. I'm so excited to play, playing wood, with wooden bats. So I have, haven't played with a wooden bat since ever because we never played with wooden bats. But um, it's kind of cool. Like, we're going to be out there having fun. T and, and the, you know, the one thing about softball is that uh, more than just like getting out there playing softball, it's a great time to fellowship with people. It's a, a great time to learn, you know, who's at our church and, and to connect. And so much of it, you know, you're on the bench just laughing and having a good time. Um, I, in fact, that's why I play softball is because I just love the fellowship 
because I am not competitive at all. And I don't care if we win. Um, I just want deeper community in our church. And so that's why I'm going to be there. But we do, actually, uh, just a quick thing. We do need women on the team. So if you are a woman that likes to play softball, come on out. Even if you've never played before, we'll just teach you real fast. And you can just come out and be part it's of that. It's super easy. Hit yeah. ball, catch ball. Dude, that's done. It. Yeah. You exactly. know, just Slide. hit it. And then we'll Slide tell you as first. it goes. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. All right, so Church at the Park is today. I got really confused on that yesterday, but <laughs> nailed it today. Um, and it starts at noon. In your bulletins, don't be like me and just see 3 p.m. It's noon to 3 p.m., which we figured out later when I actually read the bulletin. Um, so it's an awesome time of just fellowship. We actually go and minister to the, the homeless people that live there, um, feed them, uh, play some music, have a little uh, encouraging talk. And it's been really awesome. A lot of people have come to know Christ, and we've really been able to build some community at this park. So come check it out if you have more questions. Um, you can just come uh, ask myself or the McKees or the kind of the people that head it up. So, so hopefully I will see you there. Yeah. Hey, just real quickly about the Church at the Park. You know, as a, a church, we're a church plant a little bit over a year. And, and from day one, we've been talking about being a church plant that wants to plant other churches, whether that be other sites, other churches, uh, we know that God works through church plants, and so I actually see the church at the park as what, kind of one of our church plants or the first church plant, because we do that every single month, and, and people come, and then there's homeless there, there's people from the surrounding neighborhood that will show up and be part of this, and so we're reaching out to a group of people that might never step foot into a church, so we're going outside the four walls to be the church, and it's a great time. So if you get a chance to check it out today, it's really, I mean, it's 12 to 3, or yeah, noon to 3, but it really goes about noon to 132-ish, um, but we'd love to have you guys come out, because that's what we want to do. We want to be a, a church plant that plants churches and makes disciples, so. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, connection boxes. One thing that's cool about the bridge here, too, is that, that we don't pass the tithe uh, plate around. So, um, oh, I totally forgot. This week in the bulletin, I didn't bring one up, um, but there's the perforated Get Connected cards. I, like, ripped off, like, ten of them. So if you don't have a perforated card, I'm sorry. I ripped it off already. Because I like to do you. a real snap. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's like this. awesome. Perfect. I was look, I, you should see me looking down. I'm all. <laughs> Let me help you. This is how you do it. you got to go full force <laughs> with it. That. Oh, I know. <sighs> My goodness. That's, that's awesome. That's dangerous. It is, but that's what the whole fun about like it is. Paper <laughs> cuts are serious. I don't want to tell you how many I got trying to <laughs> learn that. But uh, if you have one of these Get Connected cards, uh, if you just want prayer or you want to get connected, um, you can just check a box, turn it into one of these boxes around. They're really hard to miss. Um, or you can just throw your tithe or offering in there. Um, it's an easy, quick way. Every Tuesday, we as a staff pray for all of the, the cards that have prayer requests on them. And it's just, it, it's great for us to be able to just pray for you and take time out of our day and just remember to pray for our church and our church body. So, awesome. Cool. Well, hey, uh, why don't you guys stand up? We're going to continue to worship together and praise him. Good morning. My name is Eli. I'm subbing for Glenn this week. And I am very excited and very blessed to be here leading with you. I also have the very blessed opportunity to have my little brother on drums and my older brother on bass today. So, uh, very exciting. This is probably the first time we've played together in a church uh, in probably maybe three or four years. Um, and, uh, yeah, so don't discount us if we make some mistakes. So, um, this next song is called Heartbeat. Let's, uh, let's all sing together and, uh, yeah. i 
so many times and you just keep taking us back so I just thank you I thank you for that I thank you for your forgiveness God I ask that you would open our eyes to look at us the way that you look at us through loving eyes God, that we wouldn't disqualify ourselves um, but that we would trust that we're qualified in you that we wouldn't walk within our own strength but we'd walk in yours I just thank you for all that you've done for us, and I just pray that you help us to live boldly in who you made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.
But in your eyes there's only grace now You clean my clothes You read my rush You break my chains You overcome You gave your in our lives. Uh, we can only stand because of your love and your forgiveness and your grace. And so, Lord, we stand before you, God. We are guilty, and yet, Lord, because of your love for us, you declare us not guilty as we trust Jesus. And, and just through this time, Lord, as we learn about your word, help us to learn how to serve you more. Not that we would just acquire knowledge this morning, but we would understand what you want for our lives and that we would... Uh, that our lives would be an expression of worship in everything that we do as we learn more about who you are. And so bless us, Lord. Open your word to us, God. Allow you to speak this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So we are in the series, The Story. And so last week, we talked about Saul. And you remember kind of what the subject was with Saul, what his problem was? Anybody? Pride. Saul was prideful. Uh, well, it, it connects right into the, the story. And, and before we start, you know, some of you, maybe you're new to the bridge, and, and you're like, well, what's the story? You know, we're 11 weeks into this, this series called The Story, where we're going through the Bible, and it's really, it's God's redemptive plan to win his people back. It's God taking Israel through the desert, coming through and establishing themselves in the promised land, and God working through the people, and then taking that all the way out to Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for us. And now as the church, we look back at the sacrifice that he made for us, and it's just big, one continuous story of God's love and his redemptive plan for us. And so that's what the story is. We still have copies of the story so would love for you to get one, and you can start reading it. But as we talk about, you know, Saul's life, Saul was prideful. He was the first king of Israel. And then what happens is that there's David that comes along. And, and David is a threat to Saul. David's not trying to be a threat, but he's a threat to Saul because Saul is the king. 
And Saul starts to begin, you know, believe his own press about how great he is. And then there's the story. And if, I don't know if you've been, at church, been to church or you grew up in church. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably heard this story about David and Goliath. And so Saul's the king at that time. And there's Goliath. He's this big ogre, this big giant nine-foot ogre. And he's taunting the Israelite army. That's God's people. And he's sitting there, you know, bring out your best warriors. I'll take them on. And so the Israelites are on one uh, mountain. Philistines are on the other mountain. There's this valley. And, and uh, the, this ogre, Goliath, is like, he's like a UFC champion. And he gets into the ring and he says, let's go. Let's get it on. And no one will, everyone from the Israelite uh, army is scared. And they're hiding and they're going, we can't do this. And so this little shepherd boy, David, he's got seven older brothers, and his dad calls him out from the field and says, hey, go check on your brothers. Make sure they have enough food. Make, make sure they're taken care of. He's kind of like a water boy. And he runs up, and he, and he finds his brothers, and they're all hiding out. They're all scared. No one wants to fight Goliath. And David hears Goliath taunting God's people and taunting God. And David goes, what's this guy doing? Are you kidding me? You're letting him do this, and you're all scared and terrified? And so he goes, I'll fight Goliath. He's just a shepherd boy. And so he gets on Saul's armor, and I imagine it's like 150 pounds of armor, and David's probably a buck 25, so it's not even like it's heavier than him. And he goes, I can't fight with this. And so he gathers five uh, smooth stones. He gets a sling. And I mean, he slings a hundred and mile per hour fastball right into Goliath's head, and Goliath goes down. I mean, this little shepherd boy, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. You come to me with javelin and spear, and you've got all the, you're strong and you're tall, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and he's going to win the victory, and he does. And so what happens is that Saul sees this young you know, fighter, and he goes, wow, this guy's pretty good. And he brings him into his court. He brings him close to him. But something happens in that moment that is going to set um, David down a path. And it's going to be a result of Saul's jealousy because what happens is that the people start singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. I mean, people are along the streets, walking along, singing this song. And Saul hears this, and he goes, I can't have this. I'm the king. I'm the best. I've got pride. Everybody's got to look to me. And so he gets jealous of David. And what he does is he tries to kill David, and that takes David on a path from being a shepherd boy to what God wanted to do to bring him to being a king. And so David has to go run for his life. And he runs and he goes into a cave. And he goes out in the desert and the wilderness. But today I want to use the picture of the cave because he actually goes into a cave to hide out from Saul. And it's in those moments, those cave moments, that we can either resent what God is doing in our lives. I mean, here's David. And, and one little detail that I forgot, that David, because Saul was prideful, and we, we heard about it last week, remember? Samuel says, you know, I'm going to remove the kingship from you. Because of your pride, you're done. Well, Saul held on with all of his might, and he just clung. He's like, I'm not going to let go of this. Well, in the meantime, Samuel the prophet comes to David's family, and he comes to Jesse. And Jesse's got his older sons. And so Samuel, you know, Samuel's like, hey, is that the guy? And the Lord says, no, that's not the one. And he's got all these older brothers, and he keeps going down the line. And God says, don't look at their appearance because God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. And, he, and, and so he's got all these sons here. Jesse's got his sons. And Samuel says, none of these sons are to be anointed next king. Do you have another son? And Jesse says, I've got a, a son out in the pasture. And he's shepherding. The, he's, he's the youngest. Go get him. So they bring David back. And Samuel says, he's the one that will be anointed king, and he anoints him king. And so now, David is the, the next anointed king, but Saul is holding on. And in the meantime, Saul's chasing after him to kill him. Do you ever feel like somebody's after you? 
Do you ever feel like you're surrounded on all sides? Like, I don't know what's going to happen here. And, and, and you're, you're asking God, God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? Why I, am I in the cave? Why am I suffering? This doesn't seem just. This doesn't seem fair. And in those moments, those either make us or break us. They make us either bitter or better. They make us resentful or what I want to talk to you about today is they make us rejoice knowing that God is in control and that he's got a bigger plan. And God had to take this shepherd boy and and build his character and had to help David realize that God is all that he needed and he had to just break David before he could use him to become, become king. And for some of you, God is doing that right now in your lives. And so what I want to, my my one point today is praise in the cave. That throughout this message, I want you guys to remember this. Praise in the cave. Don't get resentful. Don't get bitter. Don't get angry with God. Just praise him in the cave because he's doing something. So how do we do that? How do we praise in the cave? Well, so David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. 1 Samuel 22, 1. We first rejoice that God's building character, that it's in the cave that God was building David's character. It was in those moments of loneliness, in those moments when he was hiding out. Imagine, Saul's trying to kill him. I mean, he can't sleep. He can't go out to get food. He's sitting there in the cave, and then something happens. And and this is something that you, this couldn't have been made up. So Saul's after David, and it says, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. Now, I'll let you figure that one out, but he's, he goes to the cave, and he says, but as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. And so some men had come to be with David, and they were in the cave there, they're hiding out together. And the guys that came, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, they were Uh, They were in debt, they were in trouble, they were distressed. There was this ragtag group of people, and they're in there with with David, and they know Saul's trying to kill him. And so, you know, Saul goes in there to go to the bathroom, and and David's there, and so his men go, David, like, there's Saul. That's the guy that's trying to kill you. Let's go, dude, you got the kill shot. Get him. Go. Go. And so David's like a Navy SEAL. This guy is amazing. And he comes up, and he cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. This is no joke. Cuts off a piece, of, and then he goes back. And this is what the Bible says. But then David's conscience began bothering him, bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to the, my Lord the king. You see his character here? He's got an opportunity to kill someone that's trying to kill him. It's a preemptive strike. He says, no. If God wants me to be the anointed king, then I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to allow God to do this. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. He restrained his men. He restrained his own heart. I mean, this is, this is David, God building character in David. David, you have an opportunity to kill Saul. You have an opportunity right now. You know you've already been anointed king. You can go and take the kingship right now. You have the right to do that. And David says, you know what? I can't do this to the, the anointed I don't care how prideful Saul is. I don't care how bad he is. I'm going to allow that to be in God's hands. And so he waits for Saul to get far enough away. And he comes out of the cave and he says, Saul, I don't know who's telling you that I'm trying to harm you. But listen to me. I'm not trying to harm you. Look, I could have killed you. And he pulls off the piece of his robe. Look, I had a chance to kill you and I didn't. Why are you believing these lies, and why are you chasing after me? And he says, you know what? Let God judge between us, but I am not going to harm you. That's character. That's character. 
When someone hurts us, someone's coming after us, what is our natural inclination? To get revenge, to get them back, to make them hurt the way that we hurt. And in this moment, David is having to restrain himself. And it takes everything in me when someone hurts me to restrain myself. It takes the power, really, of the Holy Spirit because in myself, I'm going to want to get back. But God's building character in David. And as a result of that, he can rejoice. He can rejoice. God, you're sending me through these trials. I don't know what's going on, but I know you're doing something here. And I know that you're not just going to waste this pain in my life, but you're developing this integrity that I couldn't learn any other place. I wish, (laughs) I wish that I could just go to sleep every single night and tuck my Bible under my pillow and just go to sleep and through osmosis, the Bible would just come into my life and I would be more character, more integrity, just a more godly person. I wish that could happen and yet that's not how God works. As we read his word, as we apply his word, and as he puts us through this pressure cooker of life, he is doing something that we're not even, in fact, in the cave, I don't know if David knew that God was preparing his character, but every single step, he was obedient. He kept being obedient. And God was developing and preparing him to be the king. I think about the illustration of a diamond. Do you know what a diamond is formed from? A lump of coal, carbon. And that carbon is lodged 100 miles in the depths of the earth where the temperature is 2,200 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And there's like 725,000 you know, square inch per what something. I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. But there's a lot of pressure going on there over a long period of time. And as a result of that pressure and that heat and that time, there's a diamond that's formed. And right now in your lives, God, because as a result of your suffering, as a result of your cave experience, is creating a diamond in your life. You just have to trust him and believe and rejoice that he's doing that. The next way that we rejoice in the cave or praise in the cave is to realize that God is all you need. Sometimes... You know, when things are going well in my life, I just have a human nature tendency to not depend on the Lord as much. I just do. Everything, the bills are paid, kids are doing well in school, you know, these kinds of things. Just like, hey, we can just kind of coast. And it's in those moments when we're in the cave that we realize that God is all we have at this moment. And it's in those moments of dependency that we realize that in those, that, that, when he's all that we have, he really is all that we need. So Saul is chasing after David again. And David's on this one side of the mountain, and he knows that Saul's on the other side of the mountain. It's one of those kind of like they're, yeah. So Saul has got his men, and they're coming around the mountain, and, and David has nowhere to go. He's got nowhere to flee. He knows that he's dead in the water. And I imagine in that moment that he's crying out to the Lord and he's saying, God, you got to help me here. You got to rescue me. I've got no way out. There's nowhere to go. And in the nick of time, a messenger comes to Saul and says, Saul, the Philistines are attacking. And Saul right away turns around, he gets his men, and he goes. And in that moment, David is rescued. That was a divine intervention. And maybe you've had those in your lives where right in the nick of time, God, I'm holding on by my fingertips. I don't know how this is going to happen, but God, I need you. And this is the psalm that he writes after that experience. You, Lord, are all I have, and you give me all I need. My future is in your hands. God, you're all that I have. And sometimes the securities of a career ripped away from you and the security of a relationship is taken from you. The security of what we thought our future might be is totally gone and the the disappointment comes in. And everything that we rested on and everything that we banked on is gone. And it's in those moments you realize God is all that I need. God is in the cave. He's not gonna leave me. And as a result of that, even in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your cave experience, you can continue to rejoice. You can praise in the cave. In fact, this is another cave psalm. 
that David wrote this, Psalm 57. He writes in the cave, My enemies have set a trap for me. I am weary from distress. They have dug a deep pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is confident in you, O God. My heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. He's saying, they're, they're coming after me. God, they're, I'm in distress. I, I don't know what to do next. And I just get the picture of maybe you're in a cave right now, and you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And you're like, God, I don't even know what's next, but I do know that you're in the cave with me, and you're guiding me, and you're leading me, and you're right there, and you're not going to leave me. And I find my confidence, I find my security, and nothing else but you. And in those moments, you realize, God, I need you, you're here, I love you, and I praise you. I will praise in the cave. I will praise in the cave. And then we praise in the cave by running to God and being real. We talked about this a little bit last week, about the Psalms. The Psalms are an expression of, of poetry and emotion and heartfelt prayers to the Lord. And that's what David does here. That as he's in the cave, this is another cave psalm that's literally written in the cave. He says this, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and I tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Can I just tell you, that's not the way he wrote it. The way that I just said it. I imagine David is writing this. He's got nowhere else to go. He doesn't know what his future holds, but he knows he, who holds his future. And he's crying out to the Lord. I mean, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by financial difficulties. I'm overwhelmed by relational difficulties. I'm overwhelmed with such disappointment that I can't even feel right now. I'm overwhelmed. And maybe for you, it's not just one thing, but you're overwhelmed by all kinds of circumstances. Things in your life right now that are out of your control and you keep grasping and it's, oh, you're like, God, I, I, I need to have control of this. But you don't. And you've got some sort of internal thing going on, some sort of temptation. Maybe for you it's depression, and it's, you, it's weighing you down so much you don't even want to get out of bed. And then you've got people like Saul and David, and you've got somebody coming after your character and someone coming after your reputation, and they're trying to ruin it, and they're gossiping about you, and they're trying to hurt you, and they're getting at you in certain ways that you can't even prove to other people, but you know they don't have your best interest. And you've got all of it coming at you, and you're just overwhelmed. God, I'm overwhelmed. That's what David is saying. You see, God can handle your emotions. It's not like when we come to him and we express that emotion to him that we're, we're telling him something he doesn't already know. God knows your heart even better than you do. And he invites us to be real with him. God, I need you. I cry out to you. I love you. I remember um, one day I was riding bikes with my sons, and we're going down the sidewalk, and then I hear one of my sons crying, Dad, stop! Dad, stop! And I look back, and one of my sons had, had ridden his bike into some rose bushes. And so he, his little hands were on the you know, the, 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 I would say the steering wheel, um, <laughs> handlebars, thank you. <laughs> You're like, really? He didn't know those are handlebars? And his little hands were cut up, and he had like a little thorn underneath his thumb, and, and he's kind of like trying to fight tears, and my other son says, well, he says, Luke, don't cry. I mean, God's going to make you stronger as a result of this. <laughs> Thinking, maybe that, that's too soon, dude. Um, and so I'm there, and I'm kind of pulling out the little thorn, and I'm, I'm 
wiping off the blood on his hand, and, he, and, and my little guy is just fighting back tears. And he's like, he's like, Dad, I'm going to tough this one out because I know God's going to make me stronger as a result. And he's sitting there gritting his teeth, and I'm like, buddy, it's okay. You can cry. <laughs> it hurts. That looks like it hurts. It's if you want to cry, don't, wanna, don't fight those tears. From the very beginning when my little boy, you know, my, my daughter and my boys said, it's okay to cry. It's okay to, in, in the moment, to just say, this, this stinks. This cave sucks. This is not right. This isn't fair. God invites you to come to him and say, and to cry out to him. It's okay. He loves you. You're safe with him. He wants you to express that emotion. He says, I know. I know what it feels like. You see, we don't serve this distant God out in the cosmos. We serve a God who is very real to us and actually came to our world and he lived a life Jesus understands what it means as a little boy to, to be running along and skin his knee, to cry when he's a little boy. He understands what it means to be betrayed by friends that he was supposed to trust, and it hurt him. He understands what it means to be so overwhelmed by his circumstances that he's down on his knees praying to his father, and he's sweating drops of blood. Jesus understands what it means to be hanging up on a cross, experiencing humiliation and shame and physical torture, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That the son to the father said, why does it feel like you've, you're gone? Why does it feel like I'm lonely right now? It's okay. God invites you to do that. The end of this psalm, Psalm 142, the cave psalm, David says, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me for you are good to me. The psalm, he's overwhelmed, he's complaining. And can I just say that 51 out of the 150 psalms that were written are called lament psalms or complaint psalms. David wrote many of those. You know, maybe some of you are saying, what, what, Psalms, you keep saying Psalms. You know, when I first read Psalms, I actually thought it meant, I thought it, I read it as Psalms because it's P-S-A-L-M, as, and I didn't know the Bible at all. It's like, Psalms, what is that? You know, and people would be teaching it and stuff. But I want you to, you know, if you have a Bible, you just go to the middle of the Bible, and you just open up. And oftentimes what I'll do is in my prayer time, and I've told you this before, and I'll keep telling, the, telling you this because sometimes it's just my absolute lifeline just to get through the day, to connect with the Lord. And I'll read, you know, maybe that whatever day of the month that is, just take and read that psalm. Maybe you just do psalm roulette. You just kind of open up your Bible and you just go, I'm just going to connect with this psalm right now. But then you begin to pr pray these psalms. What I want you to do is, in your program, there's a sheet in there, and it says, my psalm in the cave. And whether you do it here during this, this last song or whether you do it at home, this is something between you and God. This is something where you write out a psalm, and you write out whatever is going on in your heart right now. And you get real and honest and raw, and you say, God, I'm not going to sanitize this thing at all. You're going to get all of me, because that's what he wants. He wants your heart. He wants your honesty. And that sometime during the next day or two, that you would write a psalm. And you might just pour your heart out, just like David. God, I am so broken right now. My son has left. I don't know where he is. God, my heart just grieves the loss of him. I don't know where he is, but God, would you protect over him and rescue him 
and in the process rescue my heart. And you say, God, I am so overwhelmed with loneliness and I've got Facebook friends and I've got acquaintances, but no one really knows my heart. God, I feel so lonely. God, I just would you be here in this moment? You say, God, I, I'm a Christian, and, and maybe I've heard in the Christian community somehow that you're not supposed to be depressed because you're not trusting the Lord enough, and, and, and that's, by the way, that's not true. Christians get depressed. But you just say, Lord, I'm wrestling with the shame of that, but I'm also wrestling with the fact that I'm depressed, and I, I don't know how to deal with these emotions, God. Would you, can I just bring them before you? Some of you are dealing with a cave that no one knows about. Your cave could be same-sex attraction. There's something in your life, and you've been hiding that, and there's something in there, and, and, and it's just a cave that you have to go through. Maybe your cave is a relationship. And you say, God, I have prayed over this relationship so many times, and I come for, to you for the 200th, 300th time. God, I'm pouring my heart out again. Please change this person. And God turns around and says, I may not change this person, but I'm going to change your heart in the process. I'm going to make you new. I'm doing something here that you don't even know, and I'm preparing you for something that you, you wouldn't even imagine if I flicked on the light in the cave, you would just be destroyed knowing that how much of a blessing it's going to be. God is preparing you in the cave to praise in the cave. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Agilom. This is the first verse that I read to you this morning. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. But I love this verse. All these people that were in debt, they were discontented, they were in trouble, they were in distress, they didn't know where else to go, so they came to the cave with David, and in the midst of that, these became David's mighty fighting men. God was preparing hearts in the cave. And as we sing this last song, it's a song by Casting Crowns, and it's called Broken Together, and it's a song about marriage, about two people coming together and having these dreams and expectations for what marriage would look like, and then having those, those dreams and those expectations shattered, and two people left with the fact that we're broken together, and as we turn our hearts to the Lord, that there can be healing. And even though it's a song about marriage, the chorus is so perfect for the church because that's who, what we are. We come through these doors and we're, we're broken. We've got pain in our lives. We're in caves. But as we're in the cave together, we're broken together. And as we're broken together, we keep looking to the Lord and we keep praising him because we know that God is doing something here. He's going to bring us hope. He's going to bring us out of the cave. And for some of you right now, you're even just through this message, you're getting like a glimpse of just a beam of light coming through the cave right now. And God's going to continue to flood you with his light. But I want you to worship with this song. I want you through the, through the chorus that we're broken together, that this would be a, a psalm that we sing to the Lord to, today. So let's go before him and do that. God, I... Oh, in a room this size, Lord, I just know, God, that there are people that are in a cave. And they're trying to figure out what you're doing. And Lord, I just have to admit, the times that I've been in a cave... I don't even know what you're doing. But I've, I've been in the cave and I've been out of the cave and I've seen the way that you've worked and I've seen the preparation that you do in hearts. And Lord, let us not become resentful in those moments, but that we would surrender and open our hearts and we would praise you in the cave, knowing that you're good, knowing that you're faithful, 
knowing that you've given us promises, Lord, knowing that you love us. God, we praise you in the cave and in this moment and in this song, Lord, in our broken state, Lord, we continue to praise. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Just be broken together. If you can bring your shattered dreams, and I bring mine, could healing still be spoken and save us? The only way will last forever. It's broken together. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand. and We're going to sing that song one more time. Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
in those times in the cave, we just praise the Lord for who he is. And we just thank him for the goodness that he's given us that we were not worthy of. So as we sing this this morning, I pray that, that would be your psalm this morning, that you would bless the Lord, all oh, your soul, and worship his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, yes, bless the Lord. stand in your presence, Lord. We love you. And Lord, we trust whatever you're doing in our lives right now, that you're good and you've got a plan. And so we'll continue to praise in the cave. In your name we pray, amen. So I want to invite you if, you know, uh, sometimes We've got things to do on Sunday mornings, and we rush off, and, and we've got plans. But I would like to invite you to just hang around, grab a cup of coffee, grab some donut holes, and, and meet some people. Don't feel like you have to rush off. Um, uh, sometimes I think that it, it's the, the moments after the service when God even does most of the work. As he's building relationships, and as people are talking to each other, and being encouraged, that that's, God is, is still working. And so I want to invite you just to stick around and hang out and, uh, and, and grab some, some donuts because uh, I don't want to take those donuts home like I do every Sunday to eat, eat them. So, uh, But uh, continue to praise him in the cave. And we have some people that are going to be up here to pray with you. And so maybe you have a, a psalm that you want to pray and someone you just want someone there to hear it with you that uh, you would come up and be prayed for. God bless you. I love you.